it, this question is for Jeff. Um, when we're talking about soft secession and the, the ability for the peoples in the United States and of course other parts of the world to live peaceful lives with their own values instead of having their values imposed on them. What do you think are the most practical ways in which we can get to that point so that if we cannot even get divorced, at least we could live you know, an amicable separation until the moment that the divorce is finalized? What do you think about that? Well, I think it's happening organically in the US. It just requires people to be fed up enough. Um, people in the US move, I think, more easily and more frequently than most Europeans. I talked to Holzman about this, and he said, you know, if you have a family home in France, you know, in the United States, it's very common to, you know, you'll be having dinner with someone that say, oh, we're moving, I got a new job in Dallas. You know, this is just, this, this is much more common. I, there's just sort of more of a wanderlust in America. So maybe moving isn't as psychologically difficult. Uh, also, we have easier, better, we don't have as much rent control. We don't have as much, um, you know, it's just, it's, I think it's a little easier to buy and sell houses or to rent. Um, not everywhere, but most places. So uh, it's just a balance. You know, do you want to, to endure what you're enduring in your area? Do you want to move near more like-minded people? It's really happening grassroots. I mean, we've had school board meetings. That's about as local as it gets in the United States. I mean, most people do not want to spend Tuesday night at a school board meeting to talk about masks. But man, oh man, people are doing it. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. May I add a question just belonging to that one to uh, Jeff? Um, I, I did like very much this map you showed with these 11 nations of America, uh, 11, 11 different populations or however then you understand it. And I did like it very much and I think many here did like it very much because if it's true that there is a general tendency of this, as you call it, soft secession, that would be good. Now, is there really, let's say, a strong tendency to, in that direction? Or is it, that's not an objection, or is it wishful thinking a bit? That would be good if that is, that would be the, the reality. There is, I think, generally worldwide, one could say there is a strong tendency toward a world state, so just the opposite. So more concentration and even global concentration, which would be the total disaster. So there are maybe two tendencies going on on this world. One, this general concentration, and the opposite would be the one you were presenting now. Do you believe that it's reality and it's a strong reality? Uh, I do. I do think it's reality and I'm optimistic about it, but not necessarily again because of ideology, but just because elites have failed us and elites are uh, political, social, business in the United States, whatever, whatever form of elite you want to talk about, most of them are very globalist in political outlook. And uh, when elites fail, and they, they destroyed medicine, they destroyed education, they destroyed law, they destroyed banking, they destroyed money, they destroyed war and peace in the 20th century, they destroyed diplomacy, they destroyed religion, they destroyed the family. When, when elites fail, populism is entirely justified. It's not a dirty word. And uh, I, think, I think that's what's happening. And to be fair, probably the, the likelihood of it depends on how bad things get. People will limp along. Uh, just, I'd like to add something on this. Uh, in my opinion, the two tendencies which you refer to uh, towards centralization and towards uh, world state and the tendency towards secession are both very strong and they are working together. It's like uh, inflation is politics and deflation is reality and the result is, is uh, very low inflation or not non inflation at all. Uh, but what I can see is the aggressiveness they are using in pursuing the one world government and new world order 
is maybe a sign that the, the, the other movement Jeff was referring to is very strong as well. So at least, yeah, maybe it's wishful thinking, but maybe it's, it's reality and it's happening. At least I can see in Europe it's happening as well. You have lots of secessionist movements, uh, Catalonia and Ita in Italy we have lots of secessionists and uh, maybe there's hope in, in this. Let me add something as well, maybe a positive uh, note. Uh, this year I've taken over as president of the Free Private Cities Foundation, so I'm looking at this industry quite closely and I'm surprised. Uh, I think we're living in a historic phase of a new dynamics of city formation. And so it's not uh, in only in the sense of secession movements getting stronger, but a lot of people looking uh, into moving where they are treated best and looking into moving into new pol political arrangements, uh, uh, and it's not only in the United States. Uh, of course, uh, in Europe, uh, moving usually means a cultural change that's much starker, change of language, uh, and even if you move from Germany to Switzerland or Austria, such a cultural change, mentality change, uh, that's really a lot uh, uh, for many people. But still, uh, in Europe, uh, we see the same dynamics, and there's a particular group of people, it's the more entrepreneurial, uh, people that are looking to get out and uh, we have of course reaction and counter reaction so the tendency to control and centralize leads to other reactions and is a reaction itself against the increasing mobility uh, of uh, even high income earners that the increasing a possibility to do your business from every place uh, on the planet, more or less. Once you have Starlink, even the, the broadband uh, connection is uh, feasible uh, almost everywhere. So uh, we have tendencies like Germany next year making it even harder for entrepreneurs living. But that's a reaction against a very positive trend which has go been going on for quite a while. That there's a lot of pressure of capital, of intelligent people uh, putting their weight behind seeking other destinations, other forms, either as perpetual travelers or even creating cities. And we now have entrepreneurs in the U.S. creating new cities, uh, buying land and really trying to get a new legal status. And we have the same happening in Latin America, in Africa, and pretty soon uh, we'll have that in Europe as well. So there are lots of uh, projects leading in that uh, direction and uh, I predict that the next decade will be a decade not so much of seceding from some place uh, but moving someplace and creating something new and have a new pioneering uh, phase of history. So I'm pretty optimistic that we won't end up with the uh, one uh, central state government. Uh. If we look back uh at the history of Europe in the last 30 years. Uh, we can see that there are two phases in which uh, secessionist movements grew. The first one started after 89, 1991, and the effect was, the, the reason was, that the outer threat that came in the Cold War vanished so that people, don't, at least in Western Europe, they don't feel threatened by the Soviet Union or by Russia, and they don't feel threatened uh, still the less by China. If, if they are right or not is another question. It's different in, uh, in the Eastern European countries, particularly in Poland and the Baltic Republics, uh, where, uh, let's say, that, uh, the, um, the memories on how uh, it was inside the empire, inside the Soviet empire, is too strong that to forget it, so they have another approach to that. But uh, the secessionist movements we have now, no, uh, in particularly also in the western part of Europe, are an effect of the inner threats that came with migration. No? So uh, secessionist movements in Italy uh, as well as in, uh, uh, um, as in Spain, for instance, no? they, are, they refer to this uh, 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 movement of people inside, they come inside, they don't share their culture, they have other interests, and they are much more prone to uh, uh, accept the central government because they have no links to the local population. I don't know the United States, but uh, I, I imagine that uh, similar 
uh, uh, problems occur in the in the United States as well. Now, if if, if it's true that they have on, uh, every month, I think, 200,000 new migrants coming from the south, uh, that is an explosive uh, development. So, uh, I'd like to preface my question by uh, reading a quote from His Serene Highness Prince Hans II, the ruling prince of uh, Liechtenstein. He says, uh, democracy and self-determination are closely linked and difficult to separate. Either one believes that the state is a divine entity to be served by the people and whose borders are never to be questioned, or one believes in the principle of democracy and that the state is created by the people to serve the people. If one says yes to the principle of democracy, one cannot say no to the right of self-determination. A number of states have tried to separate democracy and the right of self-determination, but they never successfully put forward a credible argument. So I'd like to ask if you could say a few words about the potential for uh, popularizing the right of self-determination and self-secession by appealing to the inconsistency of a definition of democracy that isn't based on it. Well, I think that's a bit of a tactical question. Do you use the positive connotation of democracy or do you go against it? Uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure. It's a tactical, political question, I'd say. Uh, to go to the basis of, of, of Liechtenstein and the regime, I think it's a, it's a model that they have the secession right. Uh, it will not be executed because it's already very homogeneous and, and uh, uh, society and it's considered by most of its inhabitants as quite functional uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, so, and I to add, that's a bit of the problem of the secession view. It, uh, it looks at an already homogeneous group that separates its way because it's forced to live with another group. But usually, I mean, our modern situation of life leads to uh, different groups of people with different interests living closely to, uh, next to each other. So in, even in Liechtenstein, you have... Uh, more or less the same nonsense among the political elite, so they are not very different. And Hans Adam, of course, is a relic, uh, and, and the family is a relic. Uh, and the villages are very rural, and they want to remain that way. Uh, so, because being so small, and still, I mean, the city is, is tiny compared to other cities, the discrepancies is, are not that large. Uh, in Austria, it's worse but not as bad as in Germany, which is a highly urbanized society. So you have a lot of urban centers, and then you have the rural population around and very different mindsets, realities of life, and so on. And if you look at the maps, even in the US, a lot of uh, election results are just showing you the difference between urban area and rural areas. Uh, so it's hard, uh, uh, I mean, and, and that, of course, made it difficult to solve the, the problems we had in Europe uh, uh, when uh, modernity showed that there's more heterogeneity than the, ba the common basis could bear. Uh, we had a lot of ethnic cleansing that made it possible for nations to go their own way, more or less. Uh, uh, and this pattern we had before, if you look at it, made it very difficult to secede. So almost every secession movement in itself and that would be the danger, we'll have some ethnic cleansing, uh, and in the best case, it's a voluntary rearrangement, resettling uh, of if, let's say, one uh, village in Liechtenstein decides that Liechtenstein in itself is becoming too modern, and they start constructing high-rises in Vaduz, who knows, whatever, yeah? Then, of course, some of the people living in the village would most of them would have jobs there or move uh, uh, to Vaduz or elsewhere have people living there. So you need another rearrangement of people to allow for that village really to express that intent. Uh, and that's a bit the problem of democracy here, that, that it assumes a kind of collective interest, uh, uh, which sometimes if you have very homogeneous societies working out great, and then democracy seems to be something great, but it just e expresses that homogeneity. And of course, that's the democracy we see in, in, in some Swiss valleys where everyone stands up uh, and raises his hand. And the great thing is they almost always raise the hand. <laughs> the same way as everyone else because they are very homogeneous and so they go along and they believe that they have common interests and that's why democracy seems to work that well but once it becomes like a stage behind which interest groups uh, try to get their interest it really becomes complicated and then I think that the nice sounding word of democracy doesn't solve much of that problem. Yeah, my question is for Jeff. 
when I see this map, I, I have to think of the enemy who is also, also making maps. And I think they call it gerrymandering. Is that right? That they, that they uh, think like, oh, we have to arrange this a little bit different, the, the election district. So maybe the people move and uh, the rulers just uh, start to redraw the map and throw some sane people in with some insane people and then you're back where you started. Is that a threat? Yes, but by concentrating people together somewhat, uh, there's more resistance to the federal edicts. Uh, you know, soft secession sometimes means just ignoring the federal government. And it appears that at least a few governors are prepared to do that on currently with respect to this vaccine mandate. So I think um, getting people together is, is, is a good idea because you, the, the goal here is to, and I, I would suppose that there's more than two sides, but let's just say there's two sides. I think both sides would, would argue that you need to remove the cancer. And, and this, this is how you do it. I mean, um, imperfect, certainly, but better than what we've got. I see a parallel between Italy and Poland in the 19th uh, century. Poland didn't exist in the 19th century. It was partitioned between Russia, uh, Austria, and, 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 and Prussia. And the most famous Polish romantic poet, Adam Mickiewicz, uh, who actually died in, in Istanbul in uh, 1855, is known for propagating the, an all-out universal war. Uh, he is famous from, for uh, saying, let me just uh, quote you, Lord, we beg you for a universal war for the freedom of peoples. And I, I believe he, mea he meant, uh, uh, definitely, he meant nation, uh, nation states. Actually, he was in uh, Istanbul to organize uh, an, an army to, to liberate, uh, to liberate uh, uh, Poland. So, Polish elites kept praying for this all-out war till 1914, and Poland was born out of World War I. And is, I remember my schooling, World War I is praised for raise, for, uh, as an event, uh, thanks to uh, uh, this event, Poland was uh, on the map, on the map again. So on the other hand, I also vividly remember my grandmother, born in the 19th, at the, at the end of the 19th century, in southern part of Poland, now southern part of Poland, then it was Austria. And she told me many, many years ago, I definitely preferred life under Austria than uh, under the, the Polish Second Republic before World War II. So that's uh, basically the same situation as, uh, uh, as you described. Uh, thank you for the question, which is very interesting and which brings us back to some comments uh, Jeff made before. Uh, in fact, uh, Poland as well as Italy, as uh, Hungary and other countries and Germany uh, there was this uh, nationalistic idea that uh, nations could be forged only in violence and blood and fire and that uh, you needed, coming back to Rahim, um, uh, an education system that was uh, apt to form perfect soldiers who would love their country, who would be willing to die for their country, who would be willing to uh, be obedient to any order coming from above. And um, interestingly, uh, Italians weren't really along these lines. Uh, one of the most common features of the history of Italy during the 18th, uh, 19th and 20th century were the complaints of the officers and generals of the army uh, about their soldiers being cowards. 
because uh, the Italians didn't really seem uh, see the 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 rationale be behind all this. Why should they shoot uh, Austrian soldiers? In fact, there were many his stories uh, during the war about uh, Italian and Austrian soldiers exchanging cigarettes or organizing uh, football games or, or even uh, trying to avoid killing each other, which was a wonderful thing in my opinion, of course. Uh, as especially as an Italian, you would risk the firing squad for something like that. If you didn't aim for your Austrian, you could be killed by your officer or your general. But um, yes, you have this idea of, the, of war as uh, the great uh, cradle of, of peoples, which is uh, an idea of the 18th century. But on the other side, you have uh, the liberal universalistic idea that uh, rules which are human, which belong to human nature, uh, are good for all humans. And uh, we have, in Italy, we have the same attitude about, about the Austrian Empire. There, are, there still are uh, people who are nostalgic of the Austrian Empire. I would like to see the Austrian Empire in northeastern Italy uh, nowadays. It would be much better than the Italian Republic. And there, for example, every year there's a gathering um, of uh, Italians, Austrians, and Slovenians, and they on a spot where the, the, the borders are very close, and they celebrate their old uh, country, which was the, the Austrian Empire. Uh, many Italians kept singing the uh, Austrian hymn, which was uh, Gott erhalte Franz den Kaiser in German, in, but it had uh, it, its different versions in, in different languages. And so in Italian it was Servi Dio l'Austriaco Imperator, which means may God uh, keep the health of our Austrian emperor, and it was called La Servidiola because it began Servidio l'Austriaco, and in some regions of Italy after unification it was a criminal offense to sing the, the Austrian hymn. And so I am nostalgic of this idea, not so much of war, but of uh, fraternity between, between the peoples. And another thing about secession, maybe it's, it's an idea, uh, it comes from history. Uh, the late uh, Roman Empire and the first uh, barbarian um, kingdoms, they saw communities where different people her, peoples had different laws. We are used to see territory, state, and laws as a unity. So we speak about secession, and usually it's physical secession. Maybe we could also start thinking as a way of soft secession, uh, a secession which is a different set of rules for different peoples. Maybe with these new cities which are starting to be built. In Italy we have also initiatives along these lines, and maybe this could be another way of separating communities which don't agree on, on the same laws. I think we can all agree that centralized government's fine if it means the return of the Austro-Hungarian Empire across Europe. We'll accept that. <laughs> and it has to extend to Bodrum. Well, I'm <laughs> not sure I, I totally agree. And, and let me <laughs> explain so, some of the difficulties. And uh, it tells you a bit about why Mises may have his issues with, with this kind of national, the territorial self-determination, because really the Polish case is a very complicated one. Uh, I think a part of the process of becoming a Polish uh, nation was uh, pushed on by the Prussians trying to Germanize uh, uh, Eastern Prussia and that was really one of the impacts to have a Polish intelligentsia emerge and I think that was very uh, important for Europe. I mean the contributions, the, the intellectual and scientific contributions by Poles are immense so I think there uh, is some good in that process of nation building. Uh, it's just that we didn't have a political regime uh, that was fitting and it's hard to tell if the old structure of the Ottoman Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire would have worked out with increased nationalism uh, because the situation really is really complicated. Let me give if you give you the example of Mises' hometown, uh, Lemberg or Lviv, uh, uh, which is settled uh, 
almost entirely by Poles and German-speaking Jews, but everyone on the countryside is Ruthenian, and still it all belongs to historically Polish Galicia, which is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's such a superimposition of different political structures coming from a very different history and very different ordering structures of, of policies. It makes it almost impossible to find a constructive answer. And I think only in the way that, that uh, uh, Alessandro has like a kind of polycentric, uh, how do you call it, polycentral, polycentric uh, order of maybe super uh, positive, uh, dif different. Uh, uh, regimes for the more urban area, the rules depending on, on, on uh, uh, different interest groups uh, um, and, and so on. But just to tell you a bit about the complications, just looking at the territorial secession problem. We have in, in Austrian history a very interesting example. Um, uh, at, attempted uh, a soft uh, secession, and that was the case of Moravia actually part of the Czech Republic, in 1905. Um, there was this movement, the, the conflicts between the German population and the Czech population uh, 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 were growing, and there were a lot of conflicts at the universities and wherever, so every uh, group uh, tried to, to make their own associations, their own schools, their own uh, things. Everything has been had to be... Uh, 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 um, organized in a national way. Now, uh, there was uh, Karl Renner, who uh, happened to be an um, Austrian social democratic politician. He was then, uh, after 45, he was installed by Stalin as the president of the Austrian Republic after 45. But before, he was also favorable to the to unification of, of Austria with Germany. Um, which was not very popular after 45, but uh, he said, well, this was the best idea, and unfortunately, Hitler took it and he destroyed everything, but it would have been perfect if, if it would have worked. It did not work. And in any case, what, uh, uh, what happened in, in Moravia was that uh, uh, Renner thought out a highly complicated, I don't remember the details, but uh, a highly complicated system of organizing Czechs and, uh, and Germans on the same territory with different institutions. No? So they had their own schools and they could uh, decide on this, but uh, 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 they, vo they voted also in different chambers. So there was the, there was the idea was to have a, a Czech chamber and, and, and uh, a German chamber. Well, okay, shortly it did not work. And it could not work because uh, you need a consensus building for such things. The people must be behind these ideas. You cannot uh, plan it from, from above and then think that the people will follow you. That will never work. Well, Alessandro, please explain again. We have a Roman Empire and then we have Italy. <laughs> And I never succeeded in bringing these two uh, phenomenons together. And you kind of hint, made some hints about it. But how could it be that such an organized and, you know, militarian empire thinking and building then ended up in, in what we have today? So where is the connection uh, of, let's say, these 2,000 years ago and today? Of, of course, that's a, a big question. It's a huge bridge, but I, I never happened to understand it, really. And, and you have the talent to do it. Alessandro, per favore. <laughs> Thank you. It's a big, big question. But um, maybe we should concentrate on one particular uh, century of our history, which is the third century after Christ. It is the um, century of, of the, um, they call it the anarchical century, because there, there are lots of emperors, there are lots of civil wars, and what is most interesting is the monetary history of the third century. Uh, if you look at the curve of the loss of value of the dollar, 
and the curve of the loss of silver content of the Roman denarius during the third century, they are exactly the same. So um, you have two events. When uh, the Emperor Septimius Severus died, he said to his sons, uh, Geta and Caracalla, the important thing is you make the soldiers happy, so just pay them. And uh, during the third century after Christ, the um, um, Roman army developed into a huge bureaucracy and a machine which was eating money continuously. Uh, further, there weren't any peoples more to conquer. And so the usual solution of, of the Romans, I go to some, some country like uh, Gaul, in, in, uh, uh, the, which was conquer, conquered by Caesar, and I get all their money, it uh, wasn't working anymore because it was too far away, the line of supply wouldn't work, and so they couldn't do anything else than start taxing their own citizens. In 212, uh, Caracalla um, uh, passed a law which is called the Constitutio Antoniniana that made uh, everyone a citizen of the Roman Empire. So the empire became a nation, more or less. Starting from that time, uh, Rome stopped to be what I could call uh, um, a giant ent enterprise of uh, um, collective predators. So first it was a collection of families, then it was a huge organization, but it never uh, stopped being sort of a company. Uh, like you could compare it with the West India Company or something like that. There were some families controlling this huge enterprise which had in military conquest its uh, main issue. That's why I talked about Roman militarism and imperialism. Starting from this point, uh, Rome had to transform into what we would call a modern state or something more similar to a modern state and they had the huge problem of taxes because the bureaucracy wasn't affordable anymore. With uh, Diocletian you had uh, two huge problems, inflation, runaway inflation because of the printing of coins without any silver content anymore. Um, he tried, he was one of the first rulers who tried to stop inflation by making price controls. He failed miserably, although there were even death penalty for, for selling goods above the officially um, accepted price. Uh, he was forced at the end to, to um, leave his throne and to abdicate. But during the third century, and especially the end of the third century, this is where Rome collapses, and it collapses on fiscal reasons, because uh, it established a cleft between uh, the people and the state, what, what was called the state, or the republic, the, the res publica. Uh, during the same period, uh, the same things happened as are happening today, which is very interesting. The third century is very close to what we are living today. For example, people abandoned the cities and they established rural communities, which were the beginning of, of medieval feudalism, at least in my opinion. Um, and once uh, the Emperor Constantine tried again to uh, unify uh, the Roman Empire, not surprisingly, together with a monetary reform, he introduced the solidus, which is a um, um, pure gold coin, it's, it's impressive if you, if you get to see a solidus, it's, it's a small coin but quite heavy because it's thick. It has the, the uh, profile of Constantine with his big jaw and his uh, warrior profile on it. And it gives you the idea that gold is something valuable. It always has been and it still will be. Uh, but it was too late. The empire didn't exist anymore. Uh, you had Constantine, you had uh, Emperor Julian who tried to reinstate the, the official religion against Christianity which was uh, getting its way. Uh, it was too late and the Western Empire was lost at that point. 
uh, it survived as, a, as the Eastern Empire, which was mainly a Greek empire, in my opinion. But as I told, Italy was born during these years and during these centuries. It is a country which is based on, at least this is my opinion, of course, on distrust for government. And this is the good part of Italians. We never trusted governments because we have a tradition of being cheated by our governors, by starting from Diocletian who destroyed the currency. So this is the good part of Italy that I would like to, to preserve because uh, we are backwards, but at the same time, very, very much in advance of other peoples because uh, we, we don't believe in governments. We don't believe in regulations. We don't believe in government money. Uh, for example, during these years, we had a stealth bank run and lots of Italians took their money away from the banks. This is one of the reasons why they printed so many euros because otherwise the Italian banking system would have collapsed. So <clears throat> this is the, the future, the hope for the future, that the Italian spirit and the natural anarchy of the Italians could be an example for the others. I have a question for Alessandro. No, just kidding. For you, Rahim. Uh, do you think that one of the reasons why um, uh, state education could uh, disappear little by little is because of the nature of, of public institutions and organizations that they cannot cope with the, with the, how would I say, with the rhythm of innovation that is needed in education? Yes, yes, uh, totally. I, I, <clears throat> because, I mean, we see that with uh, the Asian example where parents are hyper-competitive usually and the state has a higher capacity uh, than Western states. Uh, it means they are more like the Prussians, uh, of course, at their time and in their context, uh, uh, willing and able to concentrate more intelligence, which is most important, and then resources for state purposes. Uh, so if education really was in the sense, uh, if it's possible to have an apparatus to roll out schooling, then uh, the Asi Asians uh, uh, would advance there and, and could uh, replace us if it was possible to build up human capital and capacity. This, and we already see the signs that uh, when you have, for example, Chinese exchange students coming to German and Austrian universities, you see that they tend to be more hardworking, uh, more trained in the an analytical uh, stuff, but much less creative and innovative and thus performing not as well as you would expect. Because if you look at the testing results, that the trend is obvious. I mean, uh, Europe is going down tremendously in all the natural sciences, mathematics, the Olympics uh, in natural sciences. That's a tremendous decline, whereas Asian countries are going up. Uh, so, uh, But on reality, it's not as bad as it looks because mostly what you get with testing is like the schooling results and uh, what really counts is the application for real life problems and there is a kind of mismatch. Uh, so I still believe uh, uh, in the case for, for innovation, and I don't think that innovation can be schooled uh, or trained. I don't think that you can school people in entrepreneurship and stuff like that, even though there are now degrees in entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, so, and that makes me hopeful in the sense that we are already seeing uh, uh, with the change of the productive structure and so on that this kind of schooling becomes less and less relevant. Uh, and even those who are maybe having good test results, but are losing out in the real game of schooling, which is the status games I mentioned, uh, who are the nerds, uh, are doing pretty well. Uh, and that's actually a good sign, because who, who's a nerd? It's, it's someone who just doesn't care about the status game. This way he's not good at the status game. Paul Graham has written about that, uh, uh, and I think he captured this, this argument quite well, uh, uh, that uh, fortunately, I mean, it's, it's technology uh, that enables the, the skill of the nerd who doesn't care for the status games and whose analytical capacity is not really linked to schooling. Uh, there's no way empirically to really show that uh, uh, there's any uh, a real world success correlated with, with the testing results uh, uh, that, that, that you have. So I think those are positive signs in showing that even in Asia there will be a tendency uh, 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 
either I mean e either this trend stops somewhere or there'll be a tendency in more variety um, um, in, in ed education and I think in most cases it means less education and, and more trial and error uh, yeah and more the way innovation really happens but there's a crackdown now in China on all private education happening uh, and I'm not sure what to make of that. Uh, it's really hard to tell. I think there are some reasons. Uh, uh, so the uh, Communist Party is quite competent, I have to say. It's all the, the structure, the apparatus. Uh, uh, still, I, I think what they are seeing is that in the private sector, a lot of it is, is also status games. And they think it's, it's uh, presti uh, prestigious consumption is the term. Uh, it's like parents, because they can show wealth and so on, they invest in a hyper-competitive way in tutoring uh, and so on. And I think it's true that a lot of that is a social loss. Uh, but of course, what the Chinese government doesn't see and can't understand is that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the tiny, small differences that uh, are most important. And I, that's how I think the crackdown on private schooling and the cracking down on peer-to-peer -peer finance uh, and, and so on uh, will not turn out as good as they hope for. Even though I think I agree with the Chinese government that nowadays most of this private education expansion and most of the private investing and, and peer to peer lending is a social loss, still the important small part where innovation happens, uh, of course, you turn that off as well with trying to track down on what's a social loss because you can't know in advance. Uh, um, so I, I'm pretty optimistic there as well. Just a, a note on that. Uh, Italy is one of the countries where homeschooling is allowed in, in Europe, and it's pretty easy. And um, it is uh, gaining lots of momentum right now. Not only uh, individual parents who homeschool their children, but uh, there are lots of parents who are beginning to organize themselves. Um, I, I, I'm trying to help them. I, uh, on my website, I have a, uh, an internet tool to get people together to homeschool their children. And um, in fact, usually homeschool children in Italy have better results than, than non-home, than public or privately schooled children. And um, I see a big hope also in, in homeschooling. In fact, technology, as you mentioned, makes schools not so important anymore. You can organize yourself, you can hire um, teachers, you can use online tutorials. There are lots of tools that you can use as, as a parent to school your children and which work perfectly well. The, the model of the, of the frontal school with the teacher and the classroom is, uh, in my opinion, is not modern anymore. We have technological tools which can can help us do something different. Uh, just a, uh, a little thing because I'm organizing as well parents uh, and there's a lot of pressure from Germany uh, coming. A lot of Germans over uh, uh, the, in particular the past two years uh, and the same happening in Austria that the amount of people homeschooling is increasing fast. So only in Austria we have thousands and thousands of people each year uh, and in Germany we have lots of Germans wanting to leave Germany for that reason and in the past they wanted to come to Austria because in Austria it's, it's allowed to do homeschooling but you need to do the annual exam uh, and uh, right now I'm, I'm helping organize a group who will get the permanent traveler status by uh, leaving Germany and then move from location to location uh, and thus escape uh, the, the German totalitarian uh, schooling uh, apparatus by still remaining close to the German speaking uh, area and Europe and, and the that's quite feasible and there's a lot of interest and traction uh, going in that direction. I, I would just add, homeschooling is exploding in the United States. The beautiful thing about COVID was that what had been previously viewed as sort of a religious right-wing movement is now being uh, understood by more people on the left and maybe a lot of them wanted to keep their kids home just because they were concerned about COVID. But once they had them home and saw the online options, they start to question. And while he mentions sort of the low uh, mental capabilities of a lot of school teachers, this is egregiously true in the United States with a very powerful public school teachers union in most places. So when you begin to take courses online, 
from anywhere. Um, and, and it turns out, if you're doing something like a first course in algebra, you can have the best algebra teacher in the world. You don't have to, online, you don't have to have the crappy algebra teacher who happens to be at your kid's public school. So, so the number one fastest growing segment of homeschoolers in the United States is black folks because they have the worst urban school scenarios and they're starting to realize it. So I think this bothers the left a lot.